I want to welcome everyone to the first seminar this fall of the Center on Poverty and Social Policy, or CPSP. My name is Irv Garfinkel, and I'm the co-director of CPSP. Our mission is to study poverty, economic insecurity, immobility, and inequality, and how social and economic policies can reduce these social ills. Life has been upended by COVID-19, but one of the silver linings is that uh, <clears throat> we had been more extensive use of online activities. And we are happy to host this seminar online and have people tune in who normally wouldn't be able to join. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker to today, Jacob Faber, an associate professor of sociology and public service at New York University. His research focuses on spatial inequality and the role of institutional actors in facilitating the reproduction of racial and spatial inequality. His most recent work focuses on the racial outcomes of New Deal housing policies. And uh, that's what we look forward to hearing today. Uh, you can view Jacob Faber's full bio in the chat. And now I will turn it over to Jacob to present his findings with us today. Jacob, all yours. All right, let me pull up, share a screen. Thank you very much for that great introduction. Uh, I hope people can hear me. Irv, can you hear me at least? Yes. Okay, great, yes. great. Um, so hello everyone, um, and thanks for, for being here. Um, uh, thank you, Chris and, and Sonia for organizing this, um, and Sophie and, and Elisa for agreeing to join this as well. Um, so as Irv said, I study uh, the causes and consequences of racial segregation in America. And so my plan today is to um, hopefully not talk for too long, uh, probably 25 to 30 minutes, and then um, hopefully have a, um, a spirited discussion after that. Um, I'm going to share some of my work showing the enormous role that federal housing policy played in intentionally segregating Americans. And I'm going to focus primarily on one policy, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, or Hulk, which was passed in 1933 and has had um, enormous consequences that can still be seen today. So, Many on the call or on the Zoom, I suppose, um, uh, aren't going to be in this camp, but I think when we think of segregation, um, we often think of it or talk about it as something from a bygone era, but for the large part, America is still highly segregated by race and ethnicity. This map shows where New Yorkers of different racial groups live, and we can clearly see um, pretty stark patterns of racial, racial isolation. Uh, most of lower Manhattan is white, central Brooklyn and eastern Queens have large isolated black communities. Latinos are concentrated in South Bronx and um, Asians are concentrated in Manhattan's Chinatown Sunset Park in Brooklyn and Flushing in Queens. Uh, we can formally measure the extent to which each race is um, isolated from each other with what is called the, um, the isolation index. Um, and so for example, uh, this says that for you know, the population of New York City, um, which is about a third white, um, the typical white New Yorker lives in a neighborhood that's about 61% white. Um, and going down this list, about, while about 29% of the city is Latino, the average um, Latino New Yorker lives in a neighborhood that's uh, just under half Latino. Uh, and we see similar patterns across the country uh, so again, while the, um, uh, the population is about 60% white nationally, the typical white American lives in a neighborhood where almost four out of five people are also white. So you know, this is also a really important thing that we can talk about later, but we often only think about you know, people of color being segregated, but these statistics reveal another crucial fact about segregation, which is that um, whites uh, tend to be the most segregated um, of the four major racial groups um, in America. And, you know, it would require 
a year or two or three of, of lectures to cover uh, the full consequences of segregation. You know, there are social, political, economic, health and environmental consequences. So I'll just point out two uh, for now. First, um, a group of economists led by Raj Chetty um, tracked virtually every American born uh, in the early 1980s through the early 2000s and found that there is dramatic racial and geographic inequality in, um, in upward mobility in achieving the American dream. Um, for example, uh, this map of New York City and the surrounding suburbs show by neighborhood um, the average adult income of people who are born into low income families. So red indicates that people who are born into poverty also tend to live in poverty as adults, while blue indicates neighborhoods where poor children are able to reach uh, the middle and affluent classes as adults. And we can clearly see that for the most part, upward mobility is quite segregated from intergenerational poverty. Um, and the places that offer poor children upward mobility tend to not be uh, communities of color. The second example is the ongoing unprecedented health and economic crisis caused by COVID-19. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of research showing that people and communities of color have suffered far more from the direct impact of the pandemic manifest as higher infection and fatality rates, as well as the subsequent economic collapse. Um, so here again, we see these overlaps between deaths from the virus, unemployment from the recession and communities of color. So how do we get here? Um, when we ask people about the causes of segregation, um, we tend to get you know, responses about how, you know, people just like to live with people like themselves. Uh, and occasionally you'll get people who will point to socioeconomic differences between races. So for example, because um, blacks tend to be poorer than whites, they, uh, blacks can't afford to live in the same neighborhoods as whites. And there's certainly some truth to both of these ideas, but there's rarely a recognition of the role that public policy um, has played and continues to play in shaping America's racial geography. Um, and the truth is that for almost a century, um, government policy has had enormous influence on where people live. Um, and for a long time, that policy um, explicitly encouraged segregation by race. So to understand the underpinnings of today's racial geography, we have to go back to the Great Depression. Uh, so starting in 1929, this was, uh, and it lasted about a decade, was the longest, deepest recession, um, a depression recession of the 20th century. Unemployment hit 25%. Uh, in 1932, four, uh, 34 million people lived in a household where there was no regular uh, full-time wage earner. Between 1929 and 33, uh, US GDP fell by around 30% and the stock market lost almost 90% of its value. Um, and the Great Depression, we don't, we don't often think about it this way, but it was also a housing crisis about half of mortgage debt was in default uh, in 1933, and hundreds of thousands of people were evicted from their homes um, and millions became homeless. Um, we know now about you know, FDR's response with the help of uh, large democratic majorities in Congress enacted a wide range of policies known as the New Deal. Uh, this political cartoon depicts FDR treating an ill Uncle Sam with dozens of New Deal remedies displayed in um, their kind of acronym form. Um, I'm not going to go through each of these bottles of medicine today, but you know there were enormous job programs that put millions of people to work on public works projects, the arts infrastructure, etc. Uh, the New Deal was the birth of the American social safety net, including social security. There were um, in, uh, widespread um, uh, improvements in labor rights and union protections. And there was massive investment in housing, uh, including the Homeowners Loan Corporation, um, which you can see in this bottle here in the middle, um, and which I'll focus on for much of the rest of, uh, of today. So the Homeowners Loan Corporation was passed in 1933, and it was intended to be to offer short-term relief for this market that was in distress. 
Um, it made funds available for people to um, uh, avoid foreclosure um, and buy back homes that were lost to foreclosure. HOLC granted $3 billion of loans in its first two years. Um, and this was about one in every 10 mortgages. So quite, uh, quite a large program. And while HOLC was intended to be short-term relief, um, it had one of two um, long-term impacts. And the first was the creation of the American Homeownership Society through the institutionalization of the long-term uniform payment mortgage. And it's worth pausing to emphasize how important this change was. Uh, prior to HOLC, there was no standardized mortgage credit that existed in the country. Um, if you were wealthy, you would buy homes with cash. You're kind of otherwise reliant on what some historians called uh, a patchwork of mortgage policies. So not only did HOLC save an industry that was flailing, but it established the primary tool for wealth accumulation for most Americans in home equity. And this is, of course, wealth that can appreciate over time, be tapped when income is inconsistent, and create opportunities for intergenerational mobility through things like investing in college and subsequent home ownership. And this is in large part why the racist design and implementation uh, and inheritance of HOLC are so important to study. So the second long-term impact, which we'll be talking more explicitly about today, is on segregation through the policy, through the practice of redlining, uh, which was then inherited by the even kind of larger federal programs of the FHA, the GI Bill, um, and private lenders as well. So redlining refers to the denial of mortgage credit to communities of color. Um, and uh, part of the implementation of Hulk included sending appraisers to hundreds of cities across the country. Uh, and these appraisers graded neighborhoods in these, uh, in these cities um, uh, based on um, presumed lending risk. Um, and they gave, grade, uh, gave neighborhoods one of four grades, A being the best grades, um, color-coded in green, and D being the worst, case, worst, worst grades color-coded in red. Um, and you know, housing finance became much harder to come by, if not impossible, um, in red areas. And this is the, uh, where the term redlining comes from. Um, we are you know, looking here at this, um, they were called residential security maps, uh, this map of Atlanta, which um, shows a typical pattern, geographic pattern of these grades where you know, the lowest grades, C and D grades, were um, uh, uh, typically um, concentrated in central cities um, and A and B grades were almost exclusively reserved for wealthy white suburbs. These grades were based on housing conditions, economic activity, and perhaps most importantly, race. Um, and in addition to these grades, um, HOLC appraisers provided rich descriptions, narrative descriptions, um, as well as kind of survey descriptions of um, every neighborhood they graded. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you an excerpt um, from uh, the, the neighborhood description uh, of this red neighborhood here in, um, in Atlanta. Um, so again, this is only part of um, what was about a page and a half of information that the appraiser um, uh, described for, about this neighborhood. You can see at the top here, there are some basic kind of descriptive uh, characteristics of the neighborhood, um, including what the appraiser deemed to be favorable and detrimental influences. Um, and under detrimental influences, we have income instability, mixture of racial groups, juvenile delinquency, um, uh, vandalism, crime, et cetera, health, traffic. Um, and then below that is a, a statistical description of the neighborhood's inhabitants, um, including st uh, standard occupations and incomes, the percent foreign born and where, importantly, where those foreign born um, households were, um, uh, were from, um, and then percent Negro. And you'll note that uh, this is the only racial category um, uh, on this form. Uh, Nathan Conley, Ken Jackson, um, and others who have conducted deeper analyses of these narratives um, documented the preoccupation, if not obsession, of appraisers with the presence of Black 
households, often um, having a single black person um, on your block gave you, uh, guaranteed you a D grade. One uh, infamous example of, you can call it the kind of micro consequences of redlining is uh, Detroit's eight mile wall. So uh, again, HOLC didn't just punish you for having people of color or the wrong immigrants um, or poor people in your neighborhood, um, but by um, being near them or being in a kind of diverse neighborhood. So this wall was constructed because it allowed a white neighborhood that was adjacent to a black neighborhood secure mortgage credit um, because this wall uh, ostensibly blocked um, blacks from integrating or um, as you can see um, on this form here in the uh, bottom left-hand corner, E, um, appraisers called it infiltration. Um, there are other examples of communities, real estate speculators, um, and local governments that built walls like this, um, notably in Miami and Atlanta. And parts of Eight Mile Wall still exist today in what has become one of the most segregated metropolitan areas um, in the whole country. Um, this map, I'm sorry, but the resolution's a little um, low here, but it shows that there's, uh, there still remains today a stark difference between the north side of Eight Mile where red dots indicate white households or white individuals uh, and the south side where blue dots indicate black individuals. Um, to give a sense of the scale, the geographic scale of HOLC, um, uh, here are all of the um, maps that we have um, uh, records for. Um, the mapping inequality group um, very generously um, went to the archives, gathered all these maps, um, digitized them, and they're all available uh, online, including those neighborhood descriptions of this URL on this slide. Um, but you can see that this covered much of the country, especially uh, the Northeast and the Rust Belt, um, less, less good coverage in, in the West. So here is New York again and the surrounding suburbs. Um, these are the, um, what are called geo-referenced um, uh, HOLC maps or grades, excuse me, um, where they kind of um, altered the, the image files to, to meet, on, uh, to line up with um, contemporary boundaries. So as with Atlanta, most neighborhoods and city centers in New York City, Jersey City, um, and Newark received the lowest grades. This is, these were kind of homes to black populations like Harlem and Brooklyn, as well as poor immigrant populations like in the Lower East Side in Manhattan. Uh, and again, A and B grades were largely reserved for wider, wealthier suburbs, which you can see in uh, kind of Essex County, New Jersey to the west, um, and it's a little bit cut off, but in Westchester County to the north of the city. So HLC, of course, 1933, this was a long time ago. So it's worth thinking about um, related historical processes and where HOLC fits. Um, and this is another re uh, residential security map, this time of Chicago, again, showing this kind of radial pattern of grades. So as I mentioned earlier, other New Deal programs, uh, notably the Federal Housing Administration or FHA uh, and the GI Bill inherited HOLC's redlining practices and expanded the use of racial covenants. We can see an excerpt of, of a racial covenant here uh, on the uh, upper right. Together, these policies funneled billions of dollars away from communities of color and towards white suburbs. Uh, by 1972, FHA had helped 11 million households buy homes um, and home, home ownership jumped from about 44% in 1930 to 63% uh, in 1970 and fewer than 1% of these loans went to black households. As home ownership opportunities opened up for whites, we were building segregated public housing, using highways to segregate neighborhoods and connect suburban bedroom com communities to job centers and displacing hundreds of thousands uh, of disproportionately people of color through urban renewal, which uh, James Baldwin famously referred to as uh, Negro removal. This conflation of race and lending risk constrained housing options for blacks, creating opportunities for um, uh, exploitation through practices such as blockbusting, 
Um, again, private lenders adopted redlining practices um, that were institutionalized by uh, the federal policies. Um, so it's, you know, of, of course, HOLC didn't invent racism in real estate, um, but it invested heavily in it um, and institutionalized it and legitimized it, setting these and other processes in motion to systematically limit opportunities for home ownership for people of color. Um, and over generations, this pulled people and investment out of cities and into predominantly white suburbs. So again, HLC was a long time ago. How can we study um, its impact? Um, so what I've done is um, gathered um, uh, US census data to calculate levels of segregation um, for hundreds of cities across the country um, for every decade from 1920 to 2010. And the, my analytical strategy is you know, fairly straightforward. Um, what I'm doing is just comparing changes over time in segregation levels between um, cities that HOLC appraisers made maps for and cities that were unappraised. Um, of course, there are lots of caveats and statistical robustness checks that I can talk about if, if you feel um, that gets worth your time, um, but all of the results um, converge on the same results, uh, in same findings, which are that cities that were appraised by HLC uh, became and stayed far more segregated than unappraised cities. So one way of visualizing this effect is to show how average levels of segregation for appraised and unappraised cities um, kind of changed over time. Um, and so here I'm gonna show the black isolation index, which again is the kind of average neighborhood percent black for the um, average um, uh, black person within a city. Uh, for cities that were appraised by HLC in red and those that were ignored by HLC uh, in blue. And we can see that in the two decades prior to HLC, there is no statistically significant difference between these two groups of cities. If anything, cities that were gonna be appraised in the future were um, a little bit less segregated than those that would go on to not be appraised. Most of those maps were made in the late 1930s. So it's no surprise that in 1940, um, we see again see that there, uh, these cities were at about the same levels of segregation. Um, but then as um, HOLC kicks in and the FHA kicks in and the GI Bill kicks in, that this gap kind of explodes in the middle of the last century um, and um, just stays persistent over time. That this gap um, that was that expanded uh, in the 50s and the 60s has not closed, uh, and this hierarchy of places remains um, quite stable um, even today. Um, there's because of the mapping inequality uh, data, there's a growing body of research showing a wide range of long-term consequences of HOLC redlining. Other work of mine has shown that the neighborhoods that were redlined 100 years ago um, are still redlined today. They were the sites of um, a disproportionate amount of subprime lending uh, during the housing boom and foreclosures during the, during the Great Recession. Uh, the New York Times had a piece in August on uh, kind of connecting redlining to uh, uh, to climate change, showing that red line neighborhoods today are far hotter uh, than neighborhoods that were not redlined. And because this suite of New Deal policies created this tool for wealth accumulation that was largely exclusive to white people in white neighborhoods, um, homeownership has become a major driver of inequality. Um, this is, you know, Matt Desmond and many others have written extensively about this. Um, and it's important to distinguish um, wealth from incomes. So when I talk about wealth, I mean um, kind of savings, um, investments, assets, home equity, et cetera. And again, this is kind of distinguished from income in that um, assets can provide economic stability, allow for, allow individuals and households to make long-term investments. Um, you know, most people can't pay for college with just income that requires some amount of uh, investment capital. Um, and wealth can be more easily transferred across generations, um, for example, through home ownership. Um, and today, wealth has become one of, if not 
the most dramatic sites for racial inequality um, in America. And there's only signs that this will get worse over time. So this chart here shows the median uh, wealth gap between um, white households uh, and black households from 1983 to 2016. And we can see that again, that this gap has um, increased quite dramatically um, over this time period um, and is trending again in the wrong direction. Um, and this specific time period is uh, uh, important to focus on because we can think about um, homeowners um, or people who are kind of, um, uh, of homeowning age in 1983 as the, the first adult children of New Deal beneficiaries. So this is the first you know, generation that was able to inherit this uh, um, highly racialized and exclusive um, tool for wealth accumulation. So where do we go from here? Um, you know, solutions are hard, uh, especially because we've since the 1930s layered so many other inequalities on top of residential segregation, schools, employment, environmental quality, et cetera. Um, the kind of good news from this um, work is that, you know, we know what we've done to segregate. So we kind of know what we have to do to desegregate. Um, and thinking back to the commonly understood ideas about why we're segregated, um, being, you know, preferences and socioeconomic differences. Again, the real truth is that for generations, the federal government has paid people to segregate. Um, and even though redlining was technically made illegal through a suite of civil rights era policies, it was you know, too little, too late. Um, undoing almost a century's worth of damage will likely require an even larger investment than New Deal policies, though with specifically anti-racist and redistributive intent. Uh, the segregationist legacy of New Deal housing policies serve um, an even larger social project by endorsing the idea that racism was and is a tool with which white Americans can improve their neighborhoods and financial position. So HOLC, FHA, and the GI Bill not only encouraged and institutionalized racist ideas about Black people and Black places, but invested heavily in them, uh, thereby ensuring that inherited housing inequality remained one of the most powerful structural determinants, determinants of racial inequality generations later. Um, on a more kind of positive note, um, uh, which is not typically where I end, um, you know, we're in this kind of social and political movement where um, structural change may be possible. Uh, there are more people aware of structural inequalities and using that language. Um, and there is quite a bit of evidence of kind of growing progressive uh, uh, movements. Um, and here's hoping that uh, that moment, momentum continues. Um, please vote uh, and uh, thank you. Looking forward to chatting with everyone. Thanks uh, so much, Dr. Faber, for that really wonderful presentation and, and thanks for joining us today. And I also wanna thank uh, Alicia, who I'll, I'll introduce in a moment, who will be moderating a conversation uh, with Dr. Faber, as well as to just everyone uh, on the other side of the computer for joining us. Uh, I'm Sophie Collier. I'm a research director at the Center on Poverty and Social Policy. And um, you know, I think it's just so important when research uses history and policy to explain the landscape that we see and encounter every day, as your work just does so clearly. Um, Housing policy is also just such a huge piece of the puzzle when it comes to fighting poverty because it consumes such a large piece of a household budget. And it's also a fundamental human need that it's an area through which you know, inequality is felt by individuals in a really real way. Um, it's also especially important in New York City where research from the Poverty Tracker, uh, a project that we run with, uh, in a partnership with Robinhood, shows that before the pandemic, you know, thousands of New Yorkers were already pushed out of their homes each year uh, through formal and informal evictions. And the COVID you know, pandemic and, and associated economic downturn just threatened even greater housing stability, similar to you know, experiences of the past that you discussed uh, in your presentation. And these, these trends also you know, widen inequality of, between neighborhoods along racial and economic lines. And just 
seeing how that's, you know, this, this cycle can repeat itself so much. Um, a big part of what we do at the center is evaluate bold policy proposals that have the potential to impact poverty, and including examining some housing policies. Um, we actually just looked at a proposal that was put forward by uh, Vice President Biden's campaign that would transform the Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Program into an entitlement. And under the proposal, everyone who's eligible would actually receive a benefit. You know, that's only about 25% of current eligibles who, who um, receive a, a voucher. We found that it could actually cut the poverty rate by nearly a quarter. Um, again, you know, caveats and, and uh, additional uh, questions can, we can answer about you know, methods and such. Um, but I'm really excited to kick off the policy conversation by introducing Alicia Mazera, a senior research analyst at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Uh, her expertise includes evaluating the degree to which federal rental assistance programs serve my marginalized populations, particularly people of color, as well as on the segment, segregated communities that have historically experienced underinvestment. She'll join uh, Dr. Faber in a conversation about the policy implications of his research findings. And uh, we're very excited to hear from you both. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Alicia. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, thanks for having me today, um, Jacob. I'm really excited to be in conversation with you. Just wanna say, I've seen a lot of presentations about this stuff at this point and yours was really well done, really easy to follow. This is the kind of information that I think we want people consuming and understanding. Um, so just to kick it off, um, you alluded to this in your presentation. I think for folks who are interested in this space and are following this space, there's been a lot of increasingly anecdotal awareness of the connection between redlining and these other New Deal policies with segregation and all these other, you know, add-on effects for inequality. Why was it important for you to really quantify this in this latest paper? Um, so uh, some colleagues of mine and I have this joke that uh, ninety percent of sociology is proving what we already know, and uh, there's there's a lot of truth to this. I mean, for decades, you know, scholars were, uh, and as well as um, you know, at the time of implementation, you know, there was opposition from the NAACP and other civil rights groups uh, to the segregationist you know, nature of these policies. Um, it's still, it's you know, it's always crucial for us to document and be. I'm reminded of the enormous role that government uh, played and plays in purposefully, intentionally driving uh, inequality, especially at this time where there um, you know, has been a real shift in the public conversation about the origins of these inequalities. Um, I also think that this work is, uh, is really just the start. Um, and I think that there are um, a lot of um, really important limitations to what I presented here. Um, and I hope that, you know, because of the generosity of the mapping inequality group, that there's going to be um, a large body of work um, uh, exploring um, kind of the where and why and how um, of what's inside, you know, it's effectively a kind of black box that, um, that I've uh, measured here. Well, I, I also hope this is just the start because um, yeah. this is really important. Um, so Sophie kind of cued us a little bit into like what is happening in our current moment. You talked a little bit about what's happening, with the social movements today. So, you know, what we're seeing right now is millions of people are falling behind on their rent. We're in a global pandemic. Um, and there's growing calls for folks saying, you know, housing is a human right. We need to disconnect it from profit. It's not, you know, it shouldn't be, um, you know, framed that way. Um, and you guys just analyzed the impact of expanding the voucher program. That's something that uh, we've been looking at at the center as well. So, but your research finds that the federal government, you know, created and enforced segregation by associating proximity to people of color with low property values. So can you reflect a little bit on the challenges of us treating housing as a commodity versus a public good and kind of how we should treat that going forward? Yeah, I, I love this uh, this framing and this question. Um, it uh, you know in in every arena where profit um, has been and is the you know, sole motivation, we see exclusion and exploitation because inequality, whether that's geographic inequality, income, race, um, creates easily identifiable uh, markets which can be avoided or targeted. And this is a problem that's inherent in capitalism. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, I study housing and this has been the, the forever story of housing. 
Um, Ibram Kendi writes about uh, what he calls the kind of vicious housing cycle where you know, racist policies harm black neighborhoods, which cause people not to want to live near blacks, which depress home values in those neighborhoods, which further cause people not to live near blacks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, this is, this is true kind of everywhere. I've lo also looked at um, kind of banking and financial service provision, the same story is there. Um, I think housing is also unique in that there's a, another kind of cultural layer uh, or problem that's created by the, the mythology of home ownership. Um, you know, that it's, that it's always the best path um, towards financial stability and mobility. Um, and it's certainly true for many, you know, home equity is the largest asset for most Americans. And that's particularly true for poor Americans and Americans of color. Um, though, because of the ways that we've um, racialized housing, neighborhoods, finance, um, that this pursuit of home ownership has always been um, quite dangerous for people of color. Uh, and we don't talk about that enough. We can think about, you know, block busting and contract buying um, of, from the middle of the last century or, you know, subprime lending of the start of uh, this century. You know, segregation um, made Black and Latino borrowers more vulnerable to predatory practices. And then during the foreclosure crisis, um, blacks lost more um, in part because of the disproportionate exposure that segregation kind of creates for communities of color. Um, this is a, a, a roundabout way of saying that, you know, this model that we've been operating with about, you know, connecting housing to profit is, um, is necessarily racist within a structurally unequal context. Uh, and that we should move more in this direction of of housing and as the human right. Um, and you know, specifically on um, uh, the recommendation of universal vouchers, I, I strongly support that. Um, uh, though it's again, you know, still important to note that there are um, really um, um, crucial problems with the current program. Um, Eva Rosen just came out with a really fantastic um, book called The Voucher Promise. Um, and one of the big stories uh, of her body of work is that um, uh, landlords often use vouchers to um, exploit renters um, uh, kind of through the constricted housing markets that segregation creates. Um, and I've done work and um, others have, have, have as well showing that there's um, uh, a quite a bit of discrimination against voucher recipients. Um, and even though some kind of states and municipalities have passed um, um, what are called source of income discrimination or anti-discrimination laws. Um, most of the evidence shows that those laws don't work at all. Um, so again, kind of making this an entitlement would be extremely beneficial, um, but that can't be the, the end. There has to be you know, um, more work put into it. Yeah, no, it's definitely a, a concern we have as well, which is if you're going to expand this program, right, you need to make sure that it's working as well as possible. So I think this is a little bit of a nice segue because I think some the other promise of the voucher, right, is that you can move to a neighborhood of your choice. But we know that we're in a world of constrained choices and unequal neighborhoods. Um, so I think some people might come away from this presentation and say, well, we created segregation, so the answer must be integration. But I also want to talk about harm, um, particularly because you've talked about all the harm that policy has done to people of color. And when I think about sometimes how neighborhoods are starting to integrate, you know, we think about gentrification or who gets to move, who's forced to move, who gets to stay and who doesn't. So what should our policy goal be here? Should it be to create racially integrated neighborhoods or should it be to really just improve these neighborhoods that have been segregated and starved of resources? Uh, this is another question that um, I love and I know there's uh, people have very strong feelings on uh, for, for a very good reason. Um, and it, because it's a very complicated question. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the most important complicating factors here is that, um, and you were kind of hinting at this, that, you know, it's very easy to talk about segregation and integration in a way that valorizes whiteness and problematizes blackness. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, there's, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with people grouping together geographically. Um, the problems are that, 
we've strongly encouraged people to isolate, um, especially wealthy white households. Um, and then we, on top of that, kind of distribute opportunity in vastly unequal ways across space. So, you know, the, the goal has to be a society where geography is not destiny. Um, and a lot of things need to happen for us to get there. Um, one of which has to be investment in historically and contemporaneously excluded communities. Um, but there's, um, you know, there's often an, a kind of related issue with this language where we are often kind of conceptualizing, uh, you know, neighborhoods as solely the built environment. So housing, roads, parks, et cetera, uh, and, and not actually the people who live in those neighborhoods. Um, and that uh, uh, for us to get to that place, um, to get to that goal, we need investments um, uh, in people. Um, so reparations is, is part of this story. We need investments in the built environment and through affordable housing um, and, and many other examples, as well as investments in, um, in institutions. So we can talk about uh, schools or policing um, uh, as well. There are a lot of layers to this. I think that's part of the policy challenge too, right? Is that we're deeply siloed and if we're not coordinating together, it becomes really hard to have a holistic answer. Um, so actually I think this is a good segue into our, my um, next question. Um, so I don't know if this is a bright spot coming out of this study, but one thing that struck me is that um, these policies that you look at, you find them to be incredibly, for lack of a better word, effective at creating really lasting and durable segregation. Um, and I, my question is, can we take any elements of sort of the design and implementation and use that as a lesson learned towards creating policy that actually creates durable and lasting equality, um, sort of aspects that go beyond sort of the motives behind the policy mm -hmm. um, to actually make anti-racist housing policy? Um, I think the, the answer is um, uh, an unambiguous yes. Um, and, you know, it's also really crucial to, to note that, you know, models for anti-racist housing policy, or at least, you know, something approaching anti-racist policy um, have existed for a long time. Um, I personally am quite guilty of this, but it's very easy to just kind of say these problems are intractable and kind of call it a day. Um, but, you know, we can think back to, uh, you know, George Romney's open communities policy uh, program or proposal where he was going to use the power of the purse of the federal government um, and deny federal funds to states or cities that fostered segregation build public housing and offered mortgages to, uh, to African-Americans in white suburban neighborhoods, um, and perhaps most importantly, allow the federal government to override um, local zoning laws. Um, you know, there's also was the, the Kerner Commission's recommendations of spending billions of dollars towards racial um, equality in, in, uh, in a cross-sector way. Um, so again, like, at the core of, of all of this, um, is, uh, you know, must be kind of a redistributive effort, which um, does mean taking and giving, um, and it has to be um, uh, kind of multi-sector in a way that kind of breaks those silos that um, you mentioned. Okay, so I think we have time for one more of my questions before we go to audience Q&A. Um, so if you're in the audience, please make sure to send your questions in the chat. Um, so we've talked a lot about sort of different institutional actors and the way the, the role that the government plays in sort of creating segregation and also being able to undo it. So I think, you know, there's a lot of lively conversation in the chat um, about, you know, people feeling a lot of feelings about this presentation. So you know, among different institutional actors, what do you think are sort of the most important levers for reform? And also for individuals who are feeling really fired up right now, what can they do to sort of help support these efforts? Uh, can I say all the institutions? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, all of them, right? But, um, you know, uh, education, criminal justice, electoral politics, I think that, you know, those are the you know, biggest 
um, you can call them obstacles or opportunities um, where kind of change needs to happen. Um, and I'm not, I'm, I'm never great at the, like, what can you do as an individual, you know, especially I'm kind of, uh, as a sociologist and kind of professionally bound to, uh, uh, kind of concede that, um, you know, no one individual is responsible for, for structural conditions, but, um, you know, it, it, informing yourself, uh, about these, these types of issues, of course, is incredibly important. Um, donating resources to, um, uh, um, to groups that are working against structural inequalities. Um, and, you know, we're seeing more and more of this, but of course, you know, being politically active. And I don't, uh, I don't mean vote. Um, I mean, get in the streets, find political organizations that are led by people of color uh, and importantly, let, let them lead. Um, and, you know, I think one of the most important things that we can do as individuals is uh, is being anti-racist in your own life, um, uh, and that means you know being accountable for your friends and family. That you know uh, you know we have uh, we have Trump because we've allowed it, um, and I want to see uh, more people uh, ruining Thanksgivings or you know declining or rescinding birthday party invitations and being explicit about why, um, uh, creating awkward silences in staff meetings that, you know, this, this discomfort of talking explicitly to our racist cousins, you know, is, is not, uh, is not more important than the lives of, of black people. Um, uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of work that, uh, that all of us can do um, uh, within our networks. Absolutely. I've been definitely creating a lot of awkward silences in staff meetings. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, so on that note, I'm going to turn, I'm going to pull some audience questions that we've been sent in the chat. Um, so one question is um, asking you to sort of talk a little bit more about the foreign born section of the appraisal forms and sort of, you know, what were the, you know, certain countries that people were looking for, ethnicities and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, this is, risking going into a whole nother uh, lecture, but um, uh, you saw kind of very briefly that um, again, kind of foreign born individuals were specifically noted um, in those neighborhoods and uh, there were Syrians, Greeks, Italians, uh, and Jews in that neighborhood. Um, so according to um, HLC appraisers and real estate concerns at the time, you know, the wrong kind of, of immigrants here. Um, and there's a, there's a really, really important um, kind of social project that uh, these housing policies contributed to, which was the consolidation of um, what we now think of as the contemporary white identity, which, um, you know, uh, Syrians, Jews, Greeks, the Irish, the uh, Italians, et cetera, um, were not considered white in the same way that we consider them uh, today, uh, a century ago, kind of before these policies. But one of the things that these policies did was that they broke up um, uh, kind of central city um, uh, European ethnic communities and pulled those people um, into um, more ethnically homogenous, um, but still racially, um, oh no, sorry, ethnically um, uh, mixed, but um, racially um, homogenous uh, suburbs. Um, uh, thereby kind of consolidating again, this idea of whiteness um, and kind of contrasting it to, um, uh, to, to blackness in particular. All right, next question. Um, have you seen similar redlining practices or policies or support of it um, or policies that support it in other countries, particularly mm -hmm. like Canada or England or places that are sort of similar to the US? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. I, I have not, but um, but to be honest, I have not um, uh, really explored that. Um, there um, uh, is a fair bit of uh, research off like in geography and urban planning about the fairly uh, um, unique um, uh, approach that the United States has uh, taken towards um, home ownership and 
uh, neighborhood and municipality development that you know we are um, uh, pretty much alone um, among peer nations in uh, the amount of power that we give to local municipalities for things like zoning. Um, and uh, of course, that's, that's all about race. Um, um, it's why if you look at, thing, at metrics like um, the number of municipalities per person, um, uh, the United States has much higher, um, uh, um, has, much more, has many more kind of segregating lines um, than, uh, than other places. Um, but um, whether or not there was a kind of big federal um, effort to segregate by race in those other countries, I do not know. I mean, the, the U.S. is also fairly uh, unique in its racial diversity. Um, so um, uh, in countries that didn't or, and don't have large um, uh, or, or have large homogenous populations, um, there isn't necessarily a, um, a need for kind of strong state intervention to segregate in that way at least by race. All right, so I think this next question is very interesting. Um, so if we remain in the black white paradigm, are we excluding the voices and stories of other racial groups, other in quotes, because other is also very otherizing, um, racial groups that are impacted by segregation and the built environment. So are researchers then asking the other to fit in their experiences into this paradigm, even though it might not speak to their experience? And are we truly getting the full picture of the impact of racism and segregation if we're only comparing two racial groups? Um, no, we're not getting, we're not getting the full picture. Um, the, you know, the United States has um, uh, changed racial paradigms um, uh, quite a bit over the last century. Um, uh, uh, the biggest shift being the one that I um, um, previously talked about, the consolidation of white identity, uh, kind of where that goes, whether or not that group expands or contrasts um, is a really um, uh, interesting question. Um, you know, African-Americans are, are not the biggest uh, non-white group in the United States anymore. Um, but the you know, reason that this work in particular focused on black white dynamics um, uh, were one that um, uh, African-Americans uh, were again, this kind of preoccupation of HOLC appraisers at the time um, because of immigration restrictions um, uh, there uh, were not very many um, people from Central and South America or Asia. Um, um, and a uh, kind of consequence of that uh, is that we don't have, um, we don't have good data on um, Latinos and um, Asians in America um, until fairly recently. Um, that um, this analysis that I did, uh, for example, would be impossible to do um, for if you wanted to look at changes in um, Asian white um, segregation, for example, um, because the census uh, doesn't provide data on Asians. Um, so, you know, again, there's the black white paradigm is, of course, limited in these very important ways. Um, uh, but I do think there is a very real way in which um, uh, the entirety of the United States um, uh, kind of is forced into this black white paradigm um, uh, because of uh, because of America. <laughs> that that's that's the country we live in. You know, where, whether or not that will change um, uh, is uh, is of course an open question. All right. Um, another question: Is there any research into the relationship between segregation and policing? Um, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, there uh, is work showing that um, uh, more segregated places have um, uh, more um, uh, kind of uh, more violent policing. Um, uh, I've done work um, um, looking at the adjudication of citizen complaints against the police in Chicago and found that um, uh, individual citizens race and uh, uh, segregation kind of interact uh, in a way to compound discrimination against African Americans. Um, uh, um, you know, one of the most um, you know, scary to me uh, 
relationships between segregation and policing um, that's emerged over the past few years has been uh, research showing that uh, more segregated places um, uh, rely more on fine, uh, criminal justice kind of fines and fees um, for uh, municipal governance. That um, again, this is a kind of this is a very clear example of the way that the segregation creates a kind of captive and exploitable population. Um, yeah. All right, I think we've got time for one more audience question. I'm sorry, we're, there's so many, which is great, but I, we're not going to get to all of them. So, um, all right, I'm going to close with this one. So, um, some folks would like you to talk a little bit more about the role of the most recent recession, the subprime kind of lending crisis um, and you know how it basically took wealth away from people who are trying to build wealth um, and how do we kind of remedy that situation? Um, reparations, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a tremendous amount of work again showing that um, segregation exacerbated uh, the subprime lending crisis and the sort of subsequent foreclosure crisis that the uh, uh, racial isolation um, uh, um, was a tool with which you know, uh, finance, the finance industry was able to strip wealth from um, uh, communities of color, um, uh, Blacks and Latinos um, in particular. Um, and uh, if um, there's, you know, the home ownership gains that African Americans have made uh, uh, between the civil rights era and uh, the year 2000 were completely wiped out um, by the by the foreclosure crisis. Um, and again, you can kind of, I don't have the, the slide right now, but the kind of trend lines on racial inequality and asset wealth uh, were also deeply um, impacted by that. Um, and the you know, current economic situation that we're um, uh, kind of uh, that we're experiencing and being. Um, uh, hurt by is only gonna is only gonna make that worse. Um, and you know, one of the sad things is we're probably not gonna know the extent of the damage for um, uh, for quite a while, um, just based on how data is collected, data are collected. All right. Well, I think we are at um, time, Jacob. Thank you so much for this spirited discussion. I'm gonna hand it back to Sophie to close us out. Thank, thank you guys both uh, so much for that great conversation. Thank and um, thanks everyone for joining us. And we're just going to wrap up and I hope everyone has a great weekend. And uh, thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you.